reptilians at local and regional level. This is part of a series of uh, webinars hosted by our platformers. So we're very happy that we are able to discuss with all of you, with almost 70 participants from many parts of Europe and outside Europe on this uh, challenging topic. And we have a very distinguished panelist uh, list here. And I will be giving the floor to Ms. Frédéric Valier, who is the Secretary General of uh, CMR. Then we will have uh, this series of discussions on adaptation resilience and how we can prepare to climate, uh, tackling the EU priorities. Then we will also discuss about the financial possibilities at the local level. And then we will also have a presentation from the uh, parliament on a report they are preparing on the, um, the impact of vulnerable populations in developing countries. And uh, last but not least, we will have an exchange with some members of Platforma and others on how they're dealing with their associations as well to tackle climate change. And then we will have a session for uh, questions and answers from the um, audience. So please feel free to write any question in the chat. And then without any delays, I will give the floor to Frédéric Valier, and then I will uh, take on the moderation. Thanks very much for your participation and for being here today. everyone good morning i'm happy to open this uh, meeting today and uh, welcome uh, all of you to this first webinar of 2021 a series uh, that platforma is holding regularly on eu development cooperation and how local and regional governments contribute to it it's a pleasure to open uh, this particular webinar on a topic dear to uh, me as I have been particularly committed uh, and for a long time uh, to fighting the effects of climate change, today we will address the key topic of adaptation and of building resilience at local and regional levels. As you know, Platforma is uh, the coalition of local and regional governments and national European global associations active in development cooperation the lead partner is the Council of European Municipalities and Regions, of which I am the Secretary General, and we have signed a framework partnership agreement in 2015 with the European Commission. Although it's quite, it is quite used now, um, uh, everybody is used to uh, online meetings, I would like just to remind you briefly uh, the rules of the game. So please uh, don't forget to mute yourself when you're not speaking to avoid uh, background noises. Click on the button, raise my hand uh, on the bottom of your screen when you want to speak. And we will, uh, 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 of course, facilitate uh, this possibility. You can also ask questions or uh, comment uh, via the uh, chat as well. And colleagues from the Secretariat are connected uh, to take note. Interpretation is provided in French, Spanish, and English. So you can just select uh, the channel on the bottom right of your screen. And the uh, session is also uh, on uh, uh, YouTube. It's uh, registered. So it will be available on uh, the YouTube channel of Platforma uh, afterwards. Um, as I was saying, Today's webinar is on adaptation to climate change, uh, and we want to uh, question the role of cities and regions in building resilience at local and regional levels to envisage more concretely the potential contribution uh, of uh, local and regional governments uh, to the EU programming for 2021-2027 and also, of course, mostly to reach the targets that we collectively uh, decided uh, as to be uh, neutral uh, by 2050, of course. Local and regional governments are suffering the consequences and impacts of climate change, and they can provide some of the solutions if they are capacitated to do so in cooperation with the European Union, but also with their national governments. Therefore, CMR and Platforma welcome the opportunity to contribute uh, to the climate debate at the uh, European level and also at international level. We participate in uh, the meetings of the COPs and other international events. Uh, and in this occasion, within the context of the new uh, European Union strategy 
on adaptation to climate change adopted last February. In parallel to this work undertaken by DG Clima uh, at the European Commission, uh, their colleagues from DG International Partnership, INPA, the former uh, DEFCO, uh, are working on seven uh, years programming in their top priorities, the external dimension of the Green Deal, as we uh, said. The new global European instrument is dedicated or has dedicated 30% of its funds to activities related to fighting the effects of climate change. We are also eager to know more about it. So we are very grateful that Ms. Wisner and Ms. Viloria for engaging with us today. At the same time, the European Parliament is about to debate and adopt an important report on the impacts of climate change on vulnerable peoples in developing countries. A few months back, I had the chance to share the challenges faced by local and regional governments with MEP Gonzalez, the rapporteur, whom I delighted to welcome today. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, dear Monica, for taking the time in this busy week to present this report to us. And I think Ms. Gonzalez will join us a bit later. Uh, the United Nations will also take part to the discussion, uh, as Mr. Moser will present the local facility dedicated to fund activities to adaptation to climate change led by local authorities. And uh, I thank him for joining us today. Local and regional governments contribute sin significantly to adapting to climate change. The local character of the impacts of climate change puts the municipalities on the front line in dealing with climate change. Local and regional governments are already active on local adaptation measures in several sectors. Local and regional governments need an integrated, cost-effective territorial approach with adaptation and mitigation hand in hand. And I must say that for a long time, we uh, as European, and I would include myself into that, we were focusing a lot on mitigation, thinking that this would uh, be uh, uh, the right path, but we realized, uh, and, and this is the case also uh, from the European institution, that we could not work on mitigation without tackling the question of adaptation. Uh, local and regional governments need a supportive framework with financial support, enabling conditions, drivers, policies, and better knowledge base for a new and effective strategy on adaptation, which considers the different conditions and approaches in different countries. Local and regional governments are ready to engage on adaptation to climate change, not only at the, the local, but also at international, and especially to developing countries, to contribute to implement the Paris Agreement. Decentralized cooperation is an important tool to contribute to refine, design, and implement greener policies that would support the climate neutrality goals, but also uh, they are uh, uh, also integrating green infrastructures and native-based solution into their urban planning, including the design of building, public spaces, and other infrastructures, but also the design of the city itself. But many actions, both at the uh, European uh, uh, Union level but, and in partner countries need external support through incentives, grants and additional resources. Exchange of best practices, of course, is key. And what decentralized cooperation brings is this possibility to uh, learn from each other and also implement uh, projects that support the uh, adaptation on climate change. So without further ado, I'm happy to pass the stick to uh, my colleague Eva Banos de Gisasola, our policy officer for climate and energy, who has been uh, very instrumental in her, all her career in uh, tackling climate change. And we have been uh, following this, I think, for the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years together with, uh, in, in our different uh, um, positions. So I'm happy to give her the floor to moderate this presentation.
great webinar. Eva, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Frédéric. And uh, thanks again, everyone, for your participation to this uh, challenging discussion. So I'll just give the floor now to Elena Wiesner Malinowska. She's the head of unit in, uh, on adaptation in DG climate. Elena has been working for, uh, for cities for a long time already. And uh, it's a very exciting moment because uh, adaptation, as you mentioned, Frédéric, was not in the table some years ago. Now we cannot talk about climate change without tackling uh, adaptation as well. So I'm happy to give you the floor, Elena. And Elena has also been, and her unit have been very committed to CMR's work. They've been participating to our expert group. So I'm happy that she is now discussing the international dimension of this strategy that was recently adopted in February. So Elena, you have the floor and you have 10 minutes for this and then I'll need to be strict on timing. So apologies in advance for this. So Elena, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, buenos dias, bonjour. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you, with Valentina, and hopefully we will offer you a story that shows uh, the main protagonists that are indeed leading the way on climate action, on climate adaptation and uh, resilience. And these are indeed the municipalities, uh, cities, local and regional governments. Um, adaptation is a teamwork. And here I would like to um, borrow a story from uh, the book of Naomi Klein, On Fire, where she said, even if our models show the doom and gloom, there is still uh, hope. And the hope comes from the social movement, from citizens' engagement, and from, from the activities of, uh, of local authorities. And indeed, since the Paris Agreement, since 2015, we have seen a surge in uh, subnational uh, activities. This was even reinforced now in pandemia, where we all stuck with our neighborhoods, where we had to improve our preparedness and where city mayors and, and local uh, governments were faced with uh, preparedness issues that are very similar on climate crisis. But let us say there's no vaccine against uh, climate. Europe has agreed last week uh, the first ever climate law, and in that uh, I would like to um, highlight the landmark Article 8, which puts in law the need for public participation and more engagement with different levels of governance uh, on climate action and energy. And this is needed because the impacts are here. Uh, be it the uh, cold spells, as we've seen, or the heat waves, be it floods or, or droughts, uh, and uh, coastal erosion that indeed uh, torments uh, our coasts. And this is even more pr pronounced in the developing world, uh, I can imagine, where cities are on rise, informal uh, settlements are on rise, and so is uh, the migration of population. So where is the adaptation strategy sitting in, in all this uh, framework? Well, first of all, it is a collaborative and very uh, comprehensive framework. Uh, to bounce on what you, Frederick, said, it's uh, typically united in diversity sort of a strategy for, for Europe. And it, it will rely on our leading structures that we have on the uh, city associations. We have the global covenant of mayors that uh, now uh, counts on support of 10, over 10,000 cities in 140 countries. Uh, you have mentioned in your uh, submissions the need of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration where the global covenant is all about it. And we're moving from a purely project level uh, policy making into uh, teams like energy poverty, just transition, and of course, adaptation in all its uh, shades. We will use the UN uh, urban agenda to steer the way to use uh, its, its potential uh, and its networks. Secondly, the adaptation strategy, I hope, sends a very strong message also to national governments uh, about the need to look at local action and consider it as a bedrock of adaptation. And this is where the equity issues, the social justice, the uh, unequal uh, impacts are very uh, pronounced. We know that even if adaptation solutions are very local, they can be transferable. And this is what we want uh, to do through the mechanism of, of the strategy to transfer 
the good examples, uh, the good projects uh, that are done uh, elsewhere. We know that cities are providing us already the stories about climate adaptation not being a cost, but being an investment. And this has been a, a, an eternal dilemma in the discussion uh, of climate action. Should I rather invest into uh, windmill farms or should I invest into uh, riverbank enhancement or um, should I re go for floodplain restoration? And here uh, the message is clear. We need to uh, invest into both. Uh, the message is also clear that Europe uh, will indeed support very much the subnational uh, regional approaches uh, to adaptation in third countries. Of course, in partnership uh, with those countries and in close uh, collaboration with, with the governments. And, and we have already a history of working together with our partners at, at different levels. So what is there? What is the content of the strategy? And here I would like uh, to say to the lazy readers, don't go just to the international part of the adaptation strategy. Please read it as a whole, because what we will try to do in Europe, we will try also uh, to mirror it uh, in, in our international outreach. I mean, first of all, we need to stop with climate blind decisions. We need to know to decide even despite uncertainties, but our action should be driven but as much as data as, as we can. We need to uh, ground our activities, our decisions in comprehensive risk management at all level. We need to bounce uh, on community engagement. And, and there, I fully agree with the figure you propose. Uh, you submit 65% uh, of the 169 targets are actually depending on community buy-in and community engagement. Locally led adaptation is definitely uh, the way to go. And we need to uh, you know, go from the scattered map of nature-based solutions located in, in cities into something uh, extremely uh, big. Uh, we wish to uh, offer uh, our partner countries the possibilities for climate risk assessments, the, the planning capacity to increase the administrative uh, capabilities. And of course, uh, knowledge will be uh, critical. In Europe, uh, we will prepare uh, digital twins of, of cities uh, at uh, local scale. Uh, we will have models for planetary scale just to have a better predictive capacities. And you know, some of the European projects have outgrown Europe. Uh, the climate services or climate proofing or some of the nature-based solutions are already uh, being uh, used elsewhere. We also want to develop standardized approaches, for instance, for built environment, very important for, for cities, vulnerable cities uh, in our partner countries, resilient water management, I can tell you when I read some of the recovery plans of our member states, I see that the future will be very much water scarce and, and approaches uh, will need to be developed. How to do it? Of course, we go through the partner countries and we plan uh, together with our colleagues uh, in development cooperation in INTPA, responsible for international partnerships, to sensitize and, and campaign on climate resilience and climate adaptation in the most vulnerable countries and those can, that, can, that are critical uh, for us, for our partnership on adaptation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Elena. I think it was extremely clear. And I think it's very good that you recall us that uh, this aspect that you mentioned about social equality as well and climate justice are key. And now this is a new dimension that is going to be in the upcoming COP in Glasgow in November. So I think that all this discussion comes very timely. Um, so thank you very much for this, Elena. And we remain at uh, your disposal to provide you with examples. This is something that we are doing at CMR and Platforma because this is the best way to really prove what we're preaching for. So thank you very much for this. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Valentina Villoria, and she works as uh, we have already heard uh, as program manager of the European Commission in the G International Partnerships in the uh, Climate Change Unit. And she's gonna give us an overview on the general framework of this new instrument 
and the specific objectives regarding uh, climate change. And for us, this is a, a very relevant point that uh, the you taking in consideration the role of the local and regional governments in, in how you're realizing the EU objectives. So, uh, Ms. Viloria, you have the floor for so 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Platform and the Council of European uh, Municipalities and Regions for the opportunity to participate in this event and Lausanne um, along with colleagues from DG Clima. So as already mentioned, my name is Valentina Vidoria uh, and today I'm uh, representing actually uh, Stefano Signori, uh, the head of unit of the European Commission DG INPA um, F1, the unit uh, in charge of climate change, sustainable energy and nuclear safety. So he sends uh, his regards and apologizes for not being here. So, um, well, I just wanted to mention that uh, well, at IMPA, we are very well aware of and uh, welcome in particular the conclusion of the report of the MEP Gonzalez. So we agree that uh, climate change is uh, definitely not a distant threat anymore and is already contributing to increasing the, the vulnerability of populations around the world, causing, causing humanitarian crisis and, uh, and uh, well, putting in jeopardy development. So um, it's clear that the most vulnerable people pay the heaviest price from disasters or increased pressure from uh, uh, on natural resources, uh, loss of biodiversity, uh, well, forced displacement, conflict, and, and pandemics. So you name it. Um, so we are uh, we're aware that uh, climate, uh, international climate, and disaster risk reduction finance are not keeping pace with adaptation needs, especially in low-income countries. And um, those are the countries with the very highest risk and the lowest adapted capacity. And these are not always uh, prioritized. So it's a challenge that we are addressing at IMPA, uh, which uh, who and where we are increasingly supporting the most vulnerable countries to strengthen their, their climate adaptation capacity and preparedness to disasters, in particular from natural hazards. So um, just to let you know that in the past uh, budgetary cycle, um, out of one euro spent by IMPA on climate change, 39, 39 uh, cents go to adaptation, 21 to mitigation, and the rest to actions that contribute to both. So only for climate adaptation actions in, in, in 2040, we provided 400 million euros, around 400 million euros. Uh, and in 2019, we don't have yet uh, the total figures for, for 2020, but for 2019, it had more than triple. So it was around 1,500, well, almost 1,600 million euros. So um, uh, as you probably know, we are now in the midst of uh, programming the, the new funds for the new uh, budgetary cycle for 2021-2027. So we aim to address the needs of the most vulnerable and uh, with a we believe a new and ambitious approach. So we will do it by implementing the Endici, which is also known as the Global Europe. So this is the single financing instrument the, of the EU's external cooperation, and which I, um, I, I hope you are all aware that contains a 30% climate related spending target. So in addition, 70, more than 75% of the financial envelope for, for these seven years will be allocated to geographical program, programs and almost half of this amount to Sub-Sahara Africa. Uh, only three, less than 4% will be allocated to, to the um, global uh, challenges program, which will cover a, a wide range of topics, including climate change. So just to summarize, the majority of the actions will be anchored in a specific geographical environment, a geopolitical environment, sorry. So it will be at national level um, and regional as well. So, um, well, we are also aligning the programming of this fund, of this uh, instrument with the objectives of the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, the Sendai Framework for DRR, and uh, we will specifically um, support national determined contributions and DCs, as well as national adaptation plans and national DRR strategies. So we are also linking this instrument with the innovative financial instruments, for example, the European, for, for, uh, European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, in order to, to broaden the scope and uh, you, you utilize this, uh, new well, these financial instruments. Um, to maximize the impact of the finance insurance products and to increase, uh, in particular, the, the private sector leverage. 
So as you as already mentioned uh, before, I believe um, by by the by the introduction. So DG Defco of the Commission has a new name since already January this year. Uh, is uh, the, the the DG for International Partnerships, or in short, DG INPA. So why international partnerships? Because uh, we are aware that we cannot succeed succeed alone in common priorities uh, such as climate change and or and others. So with uh, working in par uh, with international partnerships, we um, we attach great importance to to the local the role that the local communities play. So they are the ones that know the best uh, the problems they face on a daily basis and are definitely key in 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 building in preparedness. So in being prepared and responding to disasters and then uh, uh, rebuilding. So. The, um, the EU has acknowledged this and support of the, the important role of local authorities. Uh, this is, for example, illustrated by the decentralized cooperation projects financed under the past civil society organizations and local authorities thematic program. Uh, in the framework of the initiative, local authorities um, partnerships for sustainable uh, cities that was already financed in the previous uh, budgetary cycle. So these projects have uh, proven to be um, um, very useful, for example, to help design and adopt nature-based solutions in order to have uh, more uh, resilient and sustainable cities. So um, uh, we know we are all aware that the political mandate of local authorities encompass a wide range of issues from environment, uh, protection, climate change, mobility, energy, uh, waste management, um, pollution, and so on. So we, um, besides this, we also see ex excellent examples in the recent years of how local authorities are uh, even more key in climate actions when actions are blocked at national level, for example, um, during the Trump administration and the withdrawal of uh, the US from the Paris Agreement. So we are very much in favor of continuing to foster this partnership with some national governments to achieve uh, the Green Deal ambitious at, a, at the international level. So we want to empower them, empower them in order to boost adaptation measures and reduce vulnerabilities in the countries that are in the front line of climate change. So for example, we have another initiative and colleagues of that initiative will have a presentation later on. So the local initiative, um, which is a partnership of more than 25 uh, uh, LDCs, uh, least developed countries and uh, small island development states uh, and the, lo the local authority of these 25 countries. So we also see local as an important mechanism which uh, enables adaptation uh, that is locally conceived, uh, led and implemented. So the, since 2014, the EU has um, allocated to, to, to local $40 million uh, others, other member states have joined as well, for example, Sweden. So um, now it's an initiative that is, uh, uh, up, I believe, uh, 100 million euros and is uh, led by the by LDC countries. So we will be hearing more in the next session. So, but we know that this is not enough. We must do more. Uh, so we, we remain more than ever committed to climate adaptation and supporting countries, especially LDCs, uh, least developed countries and sea, uh, small island development states in, F, in their efforts to um, enhance resilience. And we know that local actors are key in this regard. So thank you again and uh, over to you, Eva. Thank you very much, Valentin. I think it was uh, extremely clear, and also we see the challenges ahead of us. And I think it is, is worth mentioning this um, concept of partnerships. We have seen now that with the US uh, back into the Paris Agreement discussions, we have heard last week that they have presented their second NDC. It's very challenging. They are really giving a lot of importance to this concept of partnership, and they have really offered collaboration with Europeans. So I think that we should uh, uh, take this uh, as a huge opportunity because now we have a really uh, key responsibility to show our, uh, our real actions in, in November. And um, also, I would like to mention, since you have uh, referring to the examples of the local level, that we are um, now produce a thematic note on the centralized cooperation on climate change. 
and it's a, it's a piece of work and then my colleagues will be sharing with you the, uh, the link. It's just a, a document that aims to be a simple inspirational document to all actors that are working in the Central Glass Corporation on Climate. It gives a lot of uh, links, a lot of examples, and some of our participants today have contributed with very clear and very useful examples. So I'm happy to share this with you and thank you all for your contributions to that. And you will also be uh, receiving this uh, in a more formal way. So thanks for that. And thanks, Valentina, also for encouraging us with these uh, funds that are available and also to see the, the European willingness to really help the local authorities and the regional authorities achieve a, a real change. So thanks for this collaboration. And then we also remain at your disposal for um, giving you input. Then I would also like now to give the floor to the uh, UN. And we have with us uh, Monsieur uh, Moser, Mr. Uh, Rafet Moser, and he is in charge of the uh, UN facility called LOCAL, and this is managed under the umbrella of the UN Capital Development Fund, and this is uh, you know, responding to the needs of the local authorities in terms of adaptation to climate change. So, Mr. Moser, you have the floor for another 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. So, I had a, pre a presentation, so I'm not sure if the organizers We'll be able to share the screen so but as we speak so just let me start by thank you uh for you know inviting us for you know this very important event so it's a very very important discussions on uh promotion of adaptation at the local level and uh, we are really happy to you know share our experience with the implementation of the local climate adaptive living facility which is hosted by the un capital development fund and as valentina rightly said so our you know um, it's a global partnership uh local is a global partnership with more than 30 plus partners. Uh, and our biggest uh, supporters is really the EU and its member states having financed you know, most of our uh, activities since, since the beginning. So really, we're really thankful for, for that support. Uh, so the idea um, of Local is really to uh, somehow provide a mechanism um, that um, through which local governments can channel, uh, receive finance for you know, implementation of adaptation or locally led adaptation. But at the same time, it's also a mechanism that uh, recognizing you know the contribution that lo local governments and the local level has in terms of achievement of the Paris Agreement, the NDCs, the NAP, the National Adaptation Plan, but also uh, as the um, climate-related uh, SDGs, particularly SDG 13. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, the next. Yes, thank you so much. So we have to start thinking also what, why to give you know support at this uh, local level as um, the Secretary General. Uh, rightly said uh, at the beginning of the in his opening remarks uh, when uh, really empowered and equipped local governments really have you know a stake here in the promotion of you know adaptation at the local level because they are you know positioned in a, in a un unique place to identify the needs of their local community because they have they are close to their community so they understand better than others uh, the needs at the local level at the same time when we look at you know the the mandate of local governments typically they have uh, the mandate to uh, somehow implement activities which are considered uh, in terms of adaptation ad adaptation uh, activities uh, at the same time uh, on the other hand uh, they also face you know, a huge funding and capacity gap so what we try to do here uh, is really to um, somehow meet or tap into those financing and capacity gaps that we usually observe at the local level. Because when we usually observe that in many countries, um, the only way you know, local governments can access uh, climate finance is either through national application to, you know, on a call basis or, you know, additional. Um, so there is no, no, no regular funding stream flowing to the local level so they can access to implement adaptation um, at the local level uh, using our know, regular transfer systems. So next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, so the idea, uh, so local, as I said before, uh, is a global you know, partnership with the idea of you know, promoting, establishing this country-based, standard and country-based mechanism so that uh, local governments can use it, can first access climate finance, but also use them effectively at, at the local level. And it's also important to stress on the fact that, you know, um, the, the, the idea that one of the core elements of local is to actually help local governments in, in uh, effectively using, you know, climate fi finance they are receiving at the local level. So to maximize, um, you know, the, the effectiveness of the activities. At the same time, uh, there is also uh, the objective of promoting and integrating climate change adaptation 
uh, into local government planning and budget systems, but using a participatory and also gender sensitive approach, which means that uh, communities are involved in the decision making process at the local level, but also that the activities that they are financing also are gender sensitive. Uh, we also, uh, local also uses what we call performance based climate resilience grants, uh, which ensures uh, that you no know, programming and also verification of the activities which are being spent at the local level. Uh, UNCDF has a history of 20 plus years of work with um, performance based grants, uh, which uh, attach uh, to these uh, to access of grants uh, conditions of access. Uh, and then the idea was to somehow apply that, you know, climate lenses to the performance based grants. So, uh, so that we could use the same you know, approach for uh, climate resilience at the local level. Next slide, please. So with this slide, I think it's easier to explain how local works uh, in practice. So basically, as I said before, so the idea would be to establish this um, national or country-based system at the national level, whereby national governments, they can channel funds or uh, climate finance from different sources. And here we talk about vertical funds, such as the, the Climate uh, Green Fund, but also Adaptation Fund, bilateral donors like the EU and member states. But also in some cases, we have also seen governments uh, putting, you know, they are uh, allocated their own resources and to channel through uh, the local mechanism. So we use uh, the, another key uh, aspect of local is also, we don't use parallel systems or, or ad hoc systems. We, we, we use uh, existing infrastructures in the country that are used to channel funds from the national to the local level. And here we talk about the intergovernmental fiscal transfer systems in the country so that uh, we can align uh, um, the, the granting mechanism with those uh, uh, systems already uh, existing in the country. So not creating parallel systems. And the idea would be to provide um, a top up on top of regular uh, capital grant allocations flowing to the local level, so can local governments can access that you know, additional finance, uh, that additional top up, so they can cover the adaptation um, additionality of uh, for making um, investments climate resilience at the local level. So once the local governments they receive um, that that allocation, they can then uh, together with their communities plan uh, identify adaptation needs. And at the same time, identify those priority areas that you know will be uh, financed in that specific uh, fiscal year. Uh, but then they have a list of uh, what we call a menu of investments, which which is a list of eligible investments that can be financed uh, with local grants. And this uh, menu of investment that I'm going to show a little bit uh, in the next slides are uh, somehow um, aligned with the NAP, but also the NDC's priority areas. So by doing that, we ensure that you know. Uh, whatever investments that are being financed under local are aligned with the you know nationally agreed goals in terms of you know under the Paris Agreement like the NDCs, but also under the National Adaptation Plan process. So at the same time, uh, we are you know highlighting the contribution that the local level has in terms of achievement of those nationally agreed goals. And as you can see in the circle, uh, that is the local cycle basically. So as I said before, you know, the, the granting of these um, performance-based grants are conditional to uh, com compliance uh, with you know, a set of indicators that are divided into two uh, groups. So on the one hand, we apply, uh, we have you know, indicators which are related to good governance, uh, also public financial management. So here we have indicators, um, for instance, on uh, how well you know, local governments are using and spending uh, funds, or if they are using uh, procurement rules as per government regulations, etc. So those are uh, mandatory indicators that local governments need to comply with in order to access a portion of that grant envelope. On the other hand, uh, we, have, we also have performance measures. So performance measures, uh, they are more qualitative in nature, and they have to do uh, at least 50% to do with adaptation measures. But here we also look at uh, indicators related to participatory planning, uh, gender sensitive you know, investments, the, um, the, the percentage of implementation of activities and so on. So the idea would be to uh, run uh, an annual performance assessment at the end of each financial cycle. So we can assess uh, and, you know, and review the performance of each participating local government participate in the local mechanism. So uh, the score that they will get out of that assessment, that annual assessment, will uh, impact in their subsequent allocations. That means that their subsequent uh, allocation can uh, slightly, um, will, will vary accordingly. So it can be 
uh, the best performing uh, local governments will receive a slightly higher location compared to the no, not that best performance. So by doing that, that assessment, we can also identify areas in which are somehow lagging behind and need you know, further capacity building support from the local uh, facility. So that is uh, how the, the local cycle. Next slide, please. So as I said before, um, we have um, the areas which you usually can be financed are the ones uh, in the investment menu, uh, which are also aligned, as I said before, with the NAPs and the, the NDCs. But here we I bring some of you know, the typical areas or sectors which are uh, eligible to be financed with the local grants. Uh, we usually see many countries, climate, uh, um, smart agriculture, agroforestry, but also main activities um, related to water. As you know, water is a, is a big issue for many LDCs and also seeds. So we see a lot of you know, investments in those sectors, but also cli in climate proof inf infrastructure at the local level, making sure that those infrastructures are resilient on the long run and can face climate change impacts. Next slide, please. Uh, so local is also uh, here we can um, we bring you know the, the countries which um, are currently engaged with local so local is implemented through a gradual approach which means that it is implemented through different phases so local is designed to be a learning by doing you know process so we start with a phase one which is the pilot phase where we have uh, you know we test we pilot uh, test you know the the mechanism in a few uh, local governments in the country so that it would be to somehow showcase and also test you know if the indicators are working well so we can you know, uh, move to phase two where there is um, a gradual expansion of the mechanism to additional local governments in the country usually it's, it can reach up to 10 in, in that phase so it, uh, we also call it a consolidation phase uh, and then we also support countries uh, in, in, in their quest also to um, mobilize additional resources so that to allow them to you know, continue the expansion of the mechanism to additional governments in the country until they reach phase three, which is a maturing phase where we expect the mechanism or the grants to be channeled uh, to as many local governments as possible in the countries. But we also have a, what we call a design or plan phase. This is the phase where countries um, demand or you know, request or express the interest in joining the local facility. Uh, so uh, the local facility provides support to design, to either design, but also in uh, mobilizing resources uh, for the, the kickoff to activate. So as you can see, we are currently engaging with 28, 28 countries. So the, the demands are increasing uh, very, very fast because there is a real demand from countries and it's growing very fast. You know, this demand of really taking uh, actions where it is most needed, which is actually the local level. As uh, we have you know, seen before and heard uh, today, local governments are really you now in the driving seat of you know, promoting adaptation and the communities are really in the forefront of impacts of climate change. So there's a real demand for, from the ground. So yes, uh, next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, also to mention that you know, local uh, is, um, as, as I said before, is a standard. So we are, have also applied for local to uh, become uh, an ISO so that it would be for local to become um, an, an ISO standard with the assurance that each local uh, country that would be implemented you know, those standards would be uh, somehow uh, guarantee the same quality across all local countries. Uh, but, but we also uh, have also um, published uh, uh, this publication called Finance Local Adaptation to Climate Change, which has been endorsed by the UNFCCC, the LEG uh, group, which is the LDC expert group to the UNFCCC, as a supplementary material to the to their technical guidelines for the NAPs. So with the idea of uh, you know, providing these standards, um, mechanism a standard way for the promotion of what we call the vertical integration of the NAP. So with the idea of guaranteeing uh, you know, a standardized approach for integrating national adaptation plans with the subnational level. So in the next slides, I just bring some examples just to wrap up my presentation. Uh, yeah, so also to mention that we, uh, the idea is also to uh, mediate subnational level direct access to climate finance. So local also support countries in accessing directly um, the vertical funds like the GCF, but also adaptation fund. Um, for our three countries have already achieved accreditation um, status with you no know, support from local. Here I can um, bring some examples from Benin, but also Cambodia and also Bhutan, which you know, reached um, direct access to the GCF. So now they can uh, submit uh, proposals for funding uh, from the GCF building on the local mechanism. But local also helps countries in preparing uh, proposals for GCF, 
So we are now you know, currently um, developing these regional uh, concept notes with the BOAD, which is the West Africa Development Bank, but also with the SPC in the Pacific. And that you know, makes up a pipeline of around 150 million um, um, in terms of GCF pipeline. Uh, in the, I don't know if I have still time, but you know, just to bring some examples. I'm afraid, Mr. Mosa, that maybe we can leave it for the uh, debate because we have some okay. time afterwards. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rafael Mosa. It was really interesting and see again that there is uh, a tool that is available there. I see up and running. You're already in the development phase, so we'll have more time for the discussion afterwards. So thanks very much uh, once again. Now, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Ms. Monica Silvana González. Silvana González, Ms. Silvana González, buenos días. Eh, ella es miembro del Parlamento Europeo. Ella es también la rapporteur del informe sobre los impactos sobre el cambio climático en regiones vulnerables y en países en vías de desarrollo. Como plataforma y como CMR, eh, le damos la bienvenida a este informe, puesto que pone en énfasis el importante papel de los gobiernos regionales y locales en los temas de adaptación. Sin más dilación, señora González, le paso la palabra y también le doy eh, diez minutos para su intervención. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Perfecto, sí. Okay, uh, thank you to the platform team for organizing this event, and especially thank you uh, my assistant, my team, uh, Daniel Diaz, for their uh, constant support uh, and coordinate uh, with you in this in this matter. I prefer continuing in Spanish because I begin it in English and and uh, I, I continue in, in Spain. Eh, en español. Eh, buenos días a todos. Eh, muchas gracias al secretario general eh, de, de, de esta organización, Frederic Valier, a la directora de plataforma Marlene Simón, a Amandine Saborín y a todo el equipo de plataforma por organizar este foro tan importante en un momento que considero que es clave para las eh, políticas climáticas de, de la Unión. ¿no? Gracias también a los ponentes de la Comisión eh, y de Naciones Unidas que me, que me han precedido los cuales me pongo a su disposición desde el Parlamento para progresar en la acción contra el cambio climático y elevar el marco de participación de los gobiernos locales en esta, en esta tarea que entiendo que debe ser conjunta. Hemos visto cómo desde la Comisión Europea se está desarrollando sus diferentes iniciativas bajo, bajo este paraguas del Gran Green Deal y la transversalidad de la lucha del cambio climático en todas las políticas, tanto a nivel interior, pero también a nivel exterior. ¿no? Desde la estrategia de adaptación al cambio climático hasta el nuevo instrumento eh, de, de cooperación internacional y vecindad, el, el denominado DICI, Global Europe. En esta línea, entiendo que la Comisión de Desarrollo del Parlamento Europeo está dando una respuesta a la voluntad clara de situar a las personas vulnerables en el corazón de la dimensión exterior del Green Deal, pero quizás debemos reforzar más y así lo haremos a través de los actos delegados eh, en donde eh, está, eh, haremos la programación ¿no? de, del INDIC. De forma específica, en el informe que, que hemos promovido desde mi despacho, los impactos del cambio climático en las personas vulnerables en los países en desarrollo, abordamos el cambio climático como un fenómeno que amenaza directa o indirectamente el pleno disfrute de los derechos humanos, esto es derecho a la vida, al agua, al saneamiento, a la alimentación, a la salud, a la vivienda, y como, y como causa, obviamente, o como principal causa de las migraciones eh, eh, con datos que son estremecedores. ¿no? Eh, debemos la, valorar que el cambio climático puede socavar las perspectivas del desarrollo de los países actuando como un multiplicador del riesgo de sequía, de hambrunas y por lo tanto también como causa de conflictos y, y desplazamientos forzados. ¿no? Y es capaz de profundizar, entiendo más las vulnerabilidades, aportar más desigualdad y también con una clara perspectiva de, de género. ¿no? Los países en desarrollo están, en, eh, están entre los que menos eh, responsables son del calentamiento global, pero están entre los más expuestos. Esto es lo que denominamos justicia climática y que sus poblaciones más pobres son las más vulnerables en los países al cambio climático, especialmente las mujeres. ¿no? Pero sí deciros que en este informe intentamos dar la perspectiva de que las mujeres y los jóvenes son eh, agentes de cambio, no solamente víctimas. ¿no? Eh, según el Centro de Monitoreo de Desplazamiento Interno, el 80% de los desplazados como, como consecuencia del cambio climático son mujeres y niños, y son los que más eh, expuestos están a, a efectos negativos de este cambio climático, incluido el riesgo eh, eh, 
mucho más de, de morir en catástrofes naturales. ¿no? Las personas vulnerables sufren más porque sus viviendas tienden a estar ubicadas en áreas más propensas a inundaciones, deslizamiento de tierra, sequía, etc., y, y porque carecen de los medios para aumentar su resiliencia. Sus medios de vida están muy sujetos a lo que es el cambio climático porque tienden a vivir de la agricultura, la pesca y otras actividades basadas en los recursos naturales cuya presencia puede disminuir o incluso cesar. ¿no? En definitiva, el impacto del cambio climático no es el mismo según la vulnerabilidad o, la, o, o los recursos de, de, de las personas, ¿no? eh, de las comunidades o, o de los países. Por ello entendemos que hay que mejorar la resiliencia de nuestras comunidades, reducir la vulnerabilidad general al cambio climático a través de la reducción de la pobreza y la desigualdad y la puesta en marcha de un sistema de protección social resiliente. ¿no? Eh, esto implica indudablemente eh, trabajar a nivel local en la provisión de servicios que son frecuentemente competencia local y regional, como mejorar el acceso a los sistemas de salud, el, la, el acceso al agua potable, promover iniciativas de agricultura local y sostenible, promover eh, la educación para empoderar a las nuevas generaciones a vivir de una economía eh, con bajas emisiones de carbono, elaborar planes locales de adaptación al cambio climático y también incluir en nuestros gobiernos locales la perspectiva del cambio climático a la hora de priorizar qué proyectos de cooperación internacional financiar. Eh, por este motivo entiendo que el enfoque local es crucial en las estrategias de adaptación al cambio climático porque son las comunidades locales las que están en primera línea de los impactos y son la primera red de solidaridad eh, con la que hacer frente al cambio climático. ¿no? Esto tiene mucho que ver con la cooperación descentralizada. En el, en el informe que hemos trabajado desde mi despacho, pedimos que la Comisión desarrolle un enfoque local de fortalecimiento de las comunidades y de organizaciones locales, especialmente en, en organizaciones de mujeres, ¿no? Repito, las mujeres como agente de cambio en, en, este, en este fenómeno que tenemos que, que abordar. Eh, este enfoque parte de una convicción que tanto el Estado o las Naciones Unidas no pueden hacer la transición ecológica por sí solo, y es fundamental la participación y la cooperación de los gobiernos locales y subnacionales. ¿no? Considero que es inspirador eh, lo, eh, que los gobiernos locales ya trabajan en soluciones para comunidades afectadas por el cambio climático, cooperando junto a iniciativas como es, por ejemplo, el Pacto de los Alcaldes por el Clima y la Energía, en el cual la Unión Europea está apoyando, eh, por ejemplo, en, en lo que tiene que ver con Latinoamérica, financiado a través de, de Euroclima, creo que es una buena línea de trabajo, y buenos ejemplos de colaboración también en este sentido son los proyectos sobre la gestión de residuos y adaptación al cambio climático entre las ciudades, por ejemplo, de, de Borgen y la ciudad nigeriana de Nukutu, o entre las localidades de Chatterlau en Francia y Herzenau, perdonarme la pronunciación del de, de, alemán, y la ciudad de Burkina Faso de, de Calla. ¿no? Creo que esta es una línea en la que debemos focalizar, debemos continuar con este trabajo, que regiones europeas financien proyectos de adaptación al clima en, en regiones eh, tanto de Latinoamérica como de África, en las zonas más propensas a, 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 al impacto del cambio climático. Eh, por otra parte, hemos mantenido la petición de asignar fondos del presupuesto europeo para las autoridades locales y la integración de esta en los diálogos sobre las políticas de adaptación al cambio climático. ¿no? Creo que es fundamental la participación en la elaboración y ejecución de las contribuciones determinadas a nivel nacional eh, y los planes nacionales de, de adaptación en lo que es el marco del de Acuerdo de París. ¿no? Pero la herramienta clave, eh, y creo que más inmediata, es la participación de las autoridades locales en la programación del INDIC, especialmente por el compromiso a destinar el 30% de los recursos a acciones climáticas y porque la eliminación del programa temático de autoridades locales y su geografización, o sea, quitar del apartado eh, una línea específica de autoridades locales, exige una participación más directa de las autoridades locales en la programación nacional de los planes indicativos multimanuales de cada, de cada país. Y a esto, y esto último también se ha, se ha comprometido en el INDICI en su artículo 12.2 y por otra parte eh, hemos arrancado un, un compromiso de 500 millones de euros para autoridades lo, locales en el considerando 35. Todavía obviamente esto hay que definirlo mucho mejor a través de la programación de este INDICI, ¿no? 
Eh, concluyo pidiéndoles vuestro apoyo para que las medidas eh, más importantes y novedosas recogidas en este informe, que tengo el honor de haberlo impulsado y que verá la luz el próximo mes de mayo con su aprobación en el Pleno, eh, que trata de proteger a las personas que se, ya están siendo desplazadas, muchas de ellas refugiadas porque atraviesan fronteras por desastres y cambio climático. Esta medida es un visado, una de las medidas que también eh, estamos in, in, impulsando es una de una medida del visado climático como medida de protección temporal que garantiza vías migratorias legales y seguras para las personas que necesitan una protección humanitaria como víctimas de, de desastres. Esta propuesta sugiere también el otorgar la admisión temporal o prolongada y medidas para evitar la apatridia a las personas obligadas a huir de un país eh, que en parte o en su totalidad se está volviendo o se ha vuelto inhabitable debido al cambio climático. ¿no? La patridia creo que es un concepto a tratarlo en este, en este punto. Eh, durante el próximo pleno, como os digo, en el mes de, el mes de mayo, esperemos votar este informe y, y, y daremos un pasito más para que las personas y las comunidades locales más vulnerables tengan, un mayor, eh, tengan una mayor eh, capacidad de adaptación y resiliencia al cambio climático. Una vez aprobado, nuestro trabajo entiendo que debe continuar juntos, junto con el equipo de plataforma, junto con los gobiernos locales, eh, y seguiremos haciendo incidencia en, en los estados miembros para que la adaptación al clima incluya a las autoridades autoridades locales y regionales. Esperemos contar con, con vuestro apoyo, seguir trabajando juntos y muchas gracias nuevamente por organizar este evento, por contar con vuestro apoyo y todo el apoyo eh, a este informe, que, que es nuestro primer informe en, desde este despacho y estamos eh, muy contentos de haberlos impulsado. Muchas gracias de verdad y quedamos eh, mi equipo y yo a vuestra, a vuestra disposición, como, como lo hemos hecho hasta ahora. Así que mil gracias. Okay. Many thanks, Monica. This really sounds very encouraging. And, and of course, we welcome your report and we're willing to assist you as much as we can. Thank you very much again for your very clear presentation. Then I have uh, Frederic who would like to add something. So, Frederic, go ahead, please. Vraiment pour deux minutes, même pas, parce que je dois partir dans une autre réunion. But I wanted to thank Monica really for uh, her support and uh, all the work she does in the Parliament. Uh, it's it's uh, so nice to have a, a friend of local governments in uh, in the European Parliament. We have we have a number of them, but uh, certainly uh, not so many as involved as Monica, who is uh, uh, following our activities and uh, and supporting uh, very much uh, the cooperation with Platforma, with with FAMP, of course, in in Spain. Uh, and, and with CMR. So a uh, big, big thank you, uh, Monica, and thank you for your presentation. And sorry, everyone, but I, I have to leave for another meeting. So just wanted to say hi. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Frederic, and I think that we are all together to thank you, Monica, for also including this uh, regional perspective and local perspective. It's just amazing, and, and it was really needed, and so we're very happy that it's our first report, and hopefully will be uh, the first of many upcoming ones. Muchas gracias de nuevo. And now I would like to uh, open a session where we will have a series of presentations from our local and regional governments and their associations, and that would also illustrate the points that Commission and Parliament and the EU have been claiming for. You need examples, we have examples, so we're very happy to uh, also share them with you. We will have, as you can see on the screen, uh, four uh, speakers who will be giving their perspective. So we will start with uh, Nino Rutzake, and he is the uh, spokesperson for Platforma, and he's a member of uh, Bilici City Assembly in Georgia. So I will give you the floor for maybe three, four minutes, so we can also leave some space for questions and answers. And please, um, for all participants, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat, and we will just uh, come back to those. So, Mr. Nuna Rutzake, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very and much. I'd also, like to mention that uh, you know you you also wanted to focus on uh, on. Uh, on the transportation uh, areas, I understand well, and also what are the measures that you're working on to fight uh, pollution. So please, you have the floor, Nina. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this introduction. I'm happy, it's a great pleasure to join you today for this event. Um, since we are discussing the issue, which I believe is a top priority problem on the agenda of every local authority. 
climate change has substantial negative impact on local scale and we the local authorities have important leverages at our disposal to build up resilience and to promote adaptations to new realities and transformations that we observe in the environment. I'm happy that in the Tbilisi City Assembly, I'm the member of the political team which is truly seized with this problem and which has undertaken in recent years uh, broad ranging uh, actions uh, which aim at uh, clearing up the negative consequences of environment pollution that have been piling up in our city for decades. Um, yielding to time constraints and avoiding to speak in overly broad terms about the actions that we have undertaken, I would like to concentrate, as you have said, Eva, on one specific area where we have made some major uh, interventions, and I would like to introduce to you the uh, actions that we have initiated in order to um, address a very pressing problem of air pollution in our city. Uh, but before I move to those actions and initiatives, I would like to give you some background information. I would like to say that in our case, in case of Tbilisi, the, uh, the source of the highest um, increase of carbon dioxide emissions are the private, uh, privately owned vehicles. Uh, I think it is safe and fair to say that Georgians are some of the biggest admirers of uh, uh, personal vehicles in the world. And though the uh, car ownership rate in Tbilisi is not that high, it fluctuates around uh, 38%. But at the same time, uh, it is important to bear in mind that approximately 90% of those who own personal cars, they use their cars for five days during the week. So the motorization rate is quite high. Uh, and it's important to bear in mind that the uh, number of personal vehicles uh, rapidly increase in our city. Uh, uh, again, to give you some statistical data, uh, fairly recently, just in five year time span, pre precisely from 2011 till 2016, the, uh, our city has witnessed threefold increase of, uh, uh, increase of um, personal cars. And uh, today, the uh, statistics demonstrate that we that the car ownership rate in Tbilisi is boosted by 10% per year. And also, uh, I want to add to that that 50% of those cars are over 20 years of age, and approximately 88% accounts for vehicles that uh, are over 10 years of age. So you can imagine the scale of the problem and you can imagine the severity of the uh, problem of the air pollution in Tbilisi. And we are afraid that if these dynamics and patterns of uh, motorization persist in the years to come, then uh, the problem of uh, um, uh, vehicle-induced gas pollution will be coming will become increasingly serious in Tbilisi. And to uh, tackle this problem, to confront this problem, we employ two-faceted strategy. First, what we do, we, uh, we undertake the uh, fundamental reconstruction of road infrastructure in order to induce the um, uh, users of private vehicles to change their mobility behavior to towards more eco-friendly, uh, modes of transportation, that's the first direction. And the second is we try to expand uh, the share of public transportation in the, in the urban uh, mobility scheme of the city. Uh, so let me address each, each of these two aspects in some more detail. So the first, as I have said, we fundamentally restructure our roads. And in this vein, what we do is we uh, totally redesign and renovate some of the main avenues uh, of the city. And uh, uh, this new design implies that uh, the, the priority of mobility is granted first to pedestrians, then we grant the priority of mobility to uh, the owners of bicycles and of other uh, environment friendly modes of transportation, then to public transportation, and finally to uh, uh, private vehicles. 
uh, we have already uh, renovated uh, in this manner uh, one of the central avenues of Tbilisi, which is Chavchavadze Avenue. Those of you who have been in Tbilisi know that it's really uh, the arterial road for the city. Uh, and so what we have did, uh, so what we have done here is we substantially uh, um, uh, enlarged the pavements, the sidewalks of this avenue. We have added uh, bicycle lanes and um, bus lanes. Uh, we have forbidden parkings on this avenue. There are no parking lots there. Uh, and in other words, we have uh, we did our best to create uh, intentionally intentionally uh, to create discomfort to owners of uh, private automobiles. And the idea behind this intention of creating the discomfort is to um, is to um, uh, induce to prompt the users of private vehicles to uh, uh, to rely their mobility uh, habits more on public transport, on bicycles and other eco-friendly modes of transportation, and less uh, on uh, private automobiles. Uh, uh, and we uh, plan to embark upon the similar types of infrastructural uh, res uh, developments on other roads of uh, our city as well. But we also do realize that we cannot simply, uh, that it will not be effective from our side to simply create some discomfort uh, to our citizens. Uh, and in fact, it will not be fair. Uh, and uh, that in addition to uh, restructuring the road, the roads we need to, um, and, in, and in parallel to creating disincentives of uh, using the private vehicles, that in parallel we'll have to take measures in order to um, uh, make the uh, other uh, viable alternatives of private vehicles more uh, comfortable, more accessible and available. And for that purpose, uh, what we did is we took a decision to uh, make, uh, to uh, put an emphasis on development of public transportation. And in that vein, I would like to say that we have totally uh, changed the main, uh, we have totally uh, renewed the main means of uh, public transportation, which are the public buses in our case. So uh, we have uh, replaced all the old buses that we had in our streets, uh, which were in rather poor condition and which were rather uncomfortable. We have uh, uh, replaced replaced them with brand new ones, which are very comfortable, which are uh, adapted to the needs of individuals with disabilities, which uh, are eco-friendly, and which are indeed very cheap. I mean, the bus fare uh, in Spilisi is really very low. We have already replaced approximately 90% of public buses, and uh, we plan to bring this process of replacement to an end by the end of May of this year. Um, in addition to replacing the old buses, we also um, uh, add some uh, new uh, quantities of uh, buses to the public bus fleet of Tbilisi. We want to make sure that the public transportation covers the whole city, and we want to make sure that the public trans transport is available in every part and in every corner uh, of uh, Tbilisi so that citizens don't have a seduction to use their private vehicles. Um, in addition, so we maybe just include so we can have also a few minutes for the other speakers because we'll be running out of time very soon. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so I will just uh, mention that in addition to this um, changes, we also try to develop the uh, uh, yeah, subway infrastructure. We also try to revive uh, the uh, cable car routes in Tbilisi. And I would also like to say that um, uh, these uh, uh, measures that we have undertaken, they have uh, made some really heavy blow on owners of personal vehicles. And we, as a backlash, we have received some criticism. 
uh, but uh, notwithstanding this criticism, uh, we, I think that the path that we are currently on is correct path and um, we need to follow it persistently and coherently. And I would like to say that uh, this is the road, this is the path that we, uh, the local authorities cannot take alone. We need to um, join our efforts, efforts with our citizens. We, want, we need to engage in a greater dialogue with them and enhance our communication with them. And we also do need to join our efforts with our international partners. Uh, we need to learn from each other. We need to exchange experiences and we need to act uh, and come out as a unified uh, front in tackling and addresses, addressing the problems that we have um, uh, in face of uh, climate change. Thank you. Okay, then it is, you know, I think it sounds very really exciting and, and we can see the, the energy that you put uh, behind this work that you're doing and I'm sure that uh, you will get very good uh, achievement. So now I would like to give the floor to Ms. Uh, Christelle Rancon and she was for uh, Fondo Andalou de Municipios para la Solidaridad Internacional and she would like to present a couple of projects on the centralized cooperation and also uh, to refer to the uh, role of the citizens in these uh, projects. So Christelle, you have the floor. So la parole. And, and also because we're running um, a bit out of time, maybe if you can focus your intervention for four five minutes maximum. Thank you very much. Lo, lo voy a intentar. Muchísimas gracias. Pues eso. Soy técnica de proyectos en el FAMSI. El FAMSI son las siglas del Fondo Andaluz de Municipios para la Solidaridad Internacional. Es una entidad que articula, impulsa y coordina la labor de los gobiernos locales andaluces, así como entidades sociales, académicas y de la sociedad de la economía social y solidaria en una red de cooperación y acción local y global. Son unas 200 entidades las que se integran en esta red que nació en el año 2000 para la cooperación internacional, el intercambio de buenas prácticas, la generación de conocimiento y la vinculación con actores y redes multilaterales. Es, eh, el objetivo es potenciar desde el interés público y con un enfoque territorial los objetivos de sostenibilidad social, ambiental y económica recogida en la Agenda 2030 y la nueva Agenda Urbana. Y es cierto que por su proximidad a la población, su capacidad de transformación del entorno, su agilidad en facilitar respuestas a la ciudadanía, el enfoque territorial aporta una perspectiva de cercanía a la realidad de las personas, experiencias y reflexiones y propuestas de acción. Y por ello, y como bien lo ha, lo ha mencionado uh, Elena, uh, la localización de los CDS oh. es es la clave del impulso de un cambio de modelo que logre un presente y un futuro sosteni más sostenible para todas las personas. Y conviene demostrar cómo las ciudades pueden adaptarse y mejorar la resiliencia en relación con la acción climática y situar a los gobiernos locales y regiones en el centro de estas políticas climáticas para una transición verde. ¿Cómo? Pues bueno, el fomento de la economía circular, el uso sostenible de los recursos, la apuesta, como lo hemos visto, por la movilidad verde, las energías renovables y la eficiencia energética, el apoyo a una transición ecológica con modelos de producción y consumo sostenible, permiten a los gobiernos locales fomentar la puesta en marcha de acciones de mitigación y adaptación con beneficios ambientales, sociales y económicos más amplios para la sociedad. Y en este contexto, FAMSI presta uh, atención en promover acciones que mejoren la capacidad de los territorios en dar respuestas conjuntas a problemas comunes. Se fomenta igualmente uh, impulso al desarrollo de políticas locales y regionales en la planificación estratégica, en la mejora de los servicios públicos, en actuaciones contra el cambio climático y se promueve, y eso es también importante, acciones o mecanismos que permiten lograr un incremento de la conciencia ciudadana, ciudadana perdón, sobre los principios de sostenibilidad y el impacto ambiental y social de nuestros hábitos cotidianos. Eh, también, por supuesto, impulsamos actuaciones para incentivar la preservación y la conservación del patrimonio cultural y natural y fomentamos pues, una mayor participación social en las cuestiones globales relacionadas con las, los ODS de índole más ambiental. Y a este efecto, y ya utilizo la, los últimos minutos para citaros dos ejemplos muy concretos. El primer eh, de ellos es el proyecto No hay un plan B, eh, que está cofinanciado por la Unión Europea en el marco del programa DIR, 
es un proyecto que ha pre pretendido reforzar el papel que desempeñan las pequeñas y medianas organizaciones de la sociedad civil en su labor de sensibilización para mejorar el entendimiento crítico, el compromiso y la corresponsabilidad de la ciudadanía en relación a la emergencia climática y el desarrollo sostenible. De, esto, de este modo, en los seis países del, del proyecto, pues son más de 150 organizaciones que han promovido diversas acciones de sensibilización e educación para la ciudadanía global en materia de cambio climático y, climático y vida sostenible. De hecho, la semana pasada se celebró la conferencia final del, event, del proyecto y hemos destacado la importancia de las alianzas multiactores, ¿no? este, este trabajo en equipo, como, como se subrayaba. Um, también eh, es importante subrayar el papel eh, de los gobiernos locales y regionales en, en, en interactuar entre y con distintos actores y para decidir cómo abordar las cuestiones globales. Y es importante in, implicarlos en el proceso de toma de decisión. Y es fundamental contar con las ciudades en la lucha contra los efectos del cambio climático, ya que es a nivel local, donde se está rediseñando modelos y estrategias más sostenibles de cómo vivir en las ciudades y se está liderando a nivel local la transición ecológica. Tenemos otro proyecto, eh, un proyecto que se llama Accionados, que está financiado con el programa de la cooperación territorial eh, europeo transfronterizo entre España y, y Portugal, el POCTEP, que um, trabaja con la administración local y la sociedad civil eh, tra para tratar de generar conocimientos sobre los ODD, OD, perdón, ODS ambientales en el, el entorno andaluz, extremeño y portugués. Um, se trata de, eh, de que los gobiernos locales tengan más capacidad de incidir en la planificación lo, local, en la mejora de la eficiencia de la gestión pública y en el impulso de la economía circular. Y mientras que de forma complementaria, las entidades sociales implementen microproyectos que tengan un impacto ambiental y social uh, sobre los principios de, de sostenibilidad. Um, bueno, como ya se me acaba el tiempo, uh, deciros que el espacio local uh, permite la innovación y la búsqueda de respuestas a, adaptadas y realistas a los sucesivos cambios que estamos viviendo uh, y que se, que, se, que se ven en las calles y los municipios de, de, de las ciudades. Y lo que es importante es poner también al centro las personas con una mirada global y acción de proximidad. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Christelle. Uh, it was very clear as well, and it's, I'm happy to see that you put the citizens and people at the core uh, of your activities and actions. So, muchas gracias. Now, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Madame Constance Kakoui, and she is from uh, Cité Suni France, and she's going to tell us about how the and where the French associations stand on the topic, and she will in particular give us uh, her insight on the ongoing challenges and also the launch of a mission Clima. That they are working on at the moment. So, Constance, vous avez la parole aussi pour quatre, cinq minutes maximum, parce qu'après, je me reviens donner un peu de temps pour les questions et réponses. Merci. Oui, bien sûr. Thank you very much for inviting Cities Uni France. Je vais parler en français um, et être la plus uh, rapide possible. Merci. Alors, uh, d'abord, comme déjà indiqué, uh, c'est vrai qu'à Cités Unies France, il y a eu un marqueur fort, c'était donc au moment de la COP21. Uh, et donc, et bien évidemment, les collectivités françaises engagées en coopération décentralisée avec des collectivités étrangères, et notamment uh, africaines ou dans les pays en développement, se sont retrouvées face à une question importante. Est-ce que les actions qu'elles menaient jusqu'à présent qu'il ne s'appelait pas des actions climatiques, l'étaient ou pas. Et dans ces conditions, est-ce qu'elles avaient pour, est-ce qu'elles devaient les modifier pour faire face à l'agenda, ou au contraire continuer dans des secteurs comme l'eau et l'assainissement ou autres. Donc, il s'est trouvé que beaucoup de réflexions ont été menées, mais que globalement, avec leurs partenaires, les actions se sont poursuivies dans ces différents domaines. Donc, l'enjeu aujourd'hui à Cités Unies France, c'est de voir comment toutes ces collectivités françaises vont faire pour soit devoir adapter, non pas s'adapter au changement climatique, mais adapter leurs projets qui visaient à soit une adaptation, soit une, adap une atténuation du changement climatique, ou au contraire, à poursuivre leurs actions. 
Il se trouve qu'à Cité Unis France, à l'occasion euh, donc des élections municipales en France au mois de juin, il y a eu de nombreux élus qui, euh, et des nouvelles équipes municipales qui ont souhaité que euh, la question climatique revienne à l'ordre du jour des urgences de Cité Unis France. Jusqu'à présent, on nous avions plutôt évolué sur les ODD euh, de manière justement à faire face à l'agenda 2030. Et le climat étant euh, l'ODD 13, on s'était dit que cela suffirait pour travailler dessus. Il se trouve que c'est apparu non suffisant, puisque justement toutes ces questions d'adaptation, d'atténuation se posaient de manière cruciale pour des collectivités qui étaient engagées depuis très longtemps et ne savaient plus trop si ce qu'elles faisaient était bien ou pas. Alors, pour très rapidement, en fait, la question qui se pose effectivement, c'est est-ce que les actions, euh, est-ce qu'il faut mesurer l'impact des actions de coopération décentralisée ou au contraire, est-ce qu'il faut réfléchir en amont au diagnostic qui permet de savoir quelles actions il faut mettre en place avec ces collectivités partenaires. Est-ce qu'il s'agit d'adaptation, d'atténuation ou d'autres choses, on ne sait pas. À Cité Unis France, nous n'avons pas l'expertise de leur indiquer s'il si faut faire de l'adaptation ou de l'atténuation, et on le voit bien de, 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 des échanges d'aujourd'hui, s'il faut faire les deux. C'est pour cela que nous travaillons plutôt en réseau, avec des structures comme Climate Chance, comme le GRS, je crois d'ailleurs avoir vu Clémentine Larade dans les participants, avec plusieurs structures qui, elles, ont cette expertise de pouvoir orienter les collectivités françaises sur la meilleure manière d'agir, pas seulement avec leurs partenaires localement, mais aussi en France, pour mieux comprendre la différence entre l'adaptation, l'atténuation, et la meilleure manière de mettre en place les actions les plus adaptées possibles. En conclusion, en fait, il s'agit plutôt de voir comment traiter la cause et non pas plutôt uniquement les conséquences des dérèglements climatiques. Ce que Cités Unies France voudrait faire, c'est son rôle, à savoir de faire du plaidoyer pour la reconnaissance des collectivités territoriales et de leur rôle, comme on l'a dit depuis tout à l'heure, depuis le début de ces webinaires, dans la mise en place d'actions et dans la reconnaissance de manière à ce que les financements puissent suivre. Et j'étais évidemment très attentive à tout ce qui s'est dit sur la question des financement, mais bien évidemment aussi sur la manière de travailler avec vous, avec les autres réseaux, avec les organismes et institutions comme l'Union européenne qui proposent des solutions en termes financiers, mais aussi des solutions qui permettent de travailler davantage en réseau et de travailler ensemble. Donc, bien évidemment, nous serons très attentifs à tous les messages, à toutes les discussions communes qui pourront être mises en place, à toutes les démarches aussi de sensibilisation qui pourront permettre aux collectivités françaises de mieux comprendre si effectivement elles doivent agir en amont ou plutôt déjà poursuivre des actions déjà engagées. Plusieurs pays travaillent sur les sujets dans nos groupes pays, mais évidemment, je manque de temps ici pour donner du détail. Encore une fois, Cité Unis France se réjouit de découvrir ces initiatives et en tout cas souhaite évidemment pouvoir être associé avec Platforma, mais aussi avec euh, la DG Climat, avec toutes les structures et services qui vont permettre aux collectivités françaises d'être plus efficaces et d'être plus pertinentes et légitimes aussi à agir avec leurs partenaires des différents pays. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Constance, pour ton enthousiasme et aussi pour tes messages clés. Donc, on reste aussi ouvert à la participation en partenariat, bien sûr. So, before uh, I give the uh, floor to my colleagues for the conclusions, I would like to maybe open up the floor because our uh, colleague, Amman Fosovay, is needed to attend another urgent meeting, so she won't be participating now. So, we have a few minutes for some questions, if you have any. If not, I would like to address the general questions to the speakers, and if you could respond in a few seconds, is we've been listening to all of you saying that we have the tools, we have the capacity, we have the knowledge, we have the expertise, uh, we have a COP upcoming in November, we, we have the structure framework, so what do you think is missing? Why we still do not see a real change from, uh, from the local level? What do you think we still need to make that step? And this is a question that uh, many local authorities also ask me, um, and I would like to maybe see from your perspective, what, what else would you need to make this a reality? And if you can maybe give us your input and, and insight, if you wish, in, in a few seconds, really. So who would like to respond to that? Can I? Yes, sure. So as yeah. I have said... Uh, seconds because also we need to close the, the session for technical reasons. Uh, I think that what we need is we to I, we, we need to solidify in my perspective we need to solidify uh, the cooperation among ourselves 
because we uh, we cannot tackle these problems in isolation. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we really need is to really work, as I mentioned in my presentation, we really need to work as a unified front to address the problems that are looming in front of us. Mm -hmm. Okay, many thanks, Nuna. So who else would like to maybe give an insight? On, maybe on if I can go ahead. Yes, it's okay. Rafael's, yes. So and yeah, from I, our... Allow me, yeah. if, if I, I forgot to mention earlier that because you, you were for UN, just to inform you that uh, CMR platform has recently joined the Making Cities Resilient 2013 initiative. We joined formally like a month ago, and you know it uh, already, but for those partners who are online and do not know it, Making Cities Resilient initiative is uh, is led by the uh, UN office for this uh, for disaster risk resilience. Um, and is looking into how to reduce disaster risk in alignment with the Schengen framework for disaster risk reduction, which is a period of 2015 to 2030. This is also to give you an insight that we at CMR are also committed to working internationally with different partners throughout the world. So, Rafael, please. Very happy to hear that. Thank you so much. Yeah, so from our perspective and you know, on our experience, I think uh, one of the, you know, what is really missing is the, the financing gap because there is a huge financing gap at this, you know, local level. Because as we could see, you know, most of the uh, projects and initiatives that, you know, happens at that level are really done on a project-based approach and most of them go to national uh, projects. So I think it's, you know, we need to increase access to climate finance, you know, by local governments and also recognition that local governments when really, you know, equipped and empowered can really become, you know, champions. Okay, thank you very much, Rafael. So the other speakers, do you have any insights you would like to share with us on this point? Because I don't see the hands. I don't know if uh, Elena Constance Christelle, if you want to react, because I can't hear you. Okay, I see a hand. Okay, Constance. Okay, vas-y. T'as la parole, Constance. Oui, merci beaucoup, Eva. Cela me permet justement de rajouter un point. Ce dont nous avons besoin, vous avez raison de poser la question, c'est d'abord de pouvoir porter des messages communs et notamment de se préparer efficacement à euh, porter ces messages lors de la COP26 et de tous les grands événements. Je sais bien évidemment qu'effectivement, Platforma et euh, le CCRA ont préparé euh, des messages clés, des messages importants. Et il est important de pouvoir aussi les faire porter par nos membres, les collectivités françaises, et leurs partenaires de manière à être plus efficace. Ce dont nous avons besoin également, et je le disais, c'est de pouvoir aussi partager un certain nombre d'outils de financement, de mieux comprendre comment ils fonctionnent, à qui ils sont adressés, qui est éligible, est-ce que ce sont les partenaires dans les différents pays ou est-ce que ce sont les collectivités européennes aussi qui peuvent, euh, qui peuvent euh, proposer des, des projets. Voilà. Merci Constance. Okay, and the other speakers, would you like to add something on this point? Okay, I see another hand, so... Uh, Miss uh, Pagani? Oui. The floor, please. Bonjour, uh, Bonjour. merci beaucoup de ces, cette occasion. Alors, um, l'intéressant débat. Je pense qu'une chose qui est très importante, c'est de uh, faire la lobby. <laughs> sur les gouvernements nationaux afin qu'ils reconnaissent euh, cette euh, centralité des pouvoirs locaux euh, dans l'actuation, la dans l'implémentation de l'agenda 2030 et donc surtout dans l'adoption des politiques locaux pour l'adaptation climatique, pour les changements. Et je constate que ce n'est pas toujours le cas. Euh, je constate un manque de confiance, peut-être, je ne sais pas, ou une volonté de centraliser plutôt que de laisser et promouvoir vraiment des, des politiques nationales et locales. 
voilà. Ça, euh, bon, j'étais une fois dans la tombe, mais peut-être on va revenir, on va voir. Et je, suis le, je représente ici l'Association nationale des municipalités d'Italie, ANCI. Et il y a plusieurs actions qui, vont, qui sont menées par les villes. Par exemple, la dernière que j'ai connue, c'est à travers les, pro, les, les programmes Urbat, par exemple. Euh, mais il y en a encore euh, dans, les, dans les projets financés par l'Agence des coopérations italiennes euh, qui vont, ouvrir, ou, qui vont euh, travailler, par exemple, au Sénégal, mais aussi dans d'autres euh, pays sur ce point. Mais <coughs> dit cela, euh, c'est une petite euh, enveloppe euh, qui est destinée aux autorités locales. Euh, il faudrait euh, faire vraiment euh, dans l'Europe, dans, le, dans les institutions européennes, euh, avoir un soutien, un soutien sur cela. Merci beaucoup. Okay. Merci beaucoup. Uh, grazie mille per il suo intervento, uh, signora Pagani. Okay. So, um, are there further comments from the other speakers on this point? I don't see other hands. Okay. So then uh, I would just like, because we're running a bit, uh, three minutes out of time, I would just like to come to the conclusion part. And I would just like to recall some messages that uh, Frédéric Vallier has said earlier and also all the other speakers have been uh, taking in their own intervention. And is that we have seen that the role of the local and regional governments remains key in the policy making and in the delivery of public services. And these are key in a process where we all need to work uh, more than before on adaptation if we really want to comply with the Paris Agreement. And we have been given the tools, we have the frameworks, we have uh, the financial uh, means. Now we just need to put all that together, working partnerships to really make it a reality. Leaving no one behind, of course, and really working with as many actors as we can. Then we have seen that the regional and the local governments can accompany the European Union uh, also beyond the European borders. And we have seen that this uh, climate change uh, challenge that we're working on now really open us uh, a lot of doors and then give us a lot of opportunities to work more and more internationally with uh, partners outside Europe. And we're seeing that this uh, local uh, action can really have a huge impact on the global um, action, uh, impact. Then we have also seen that the national associations of local and regional authorities in partner countries are fundamental. We have seen that they really have key instruments and key tools to work on decentralized corporations, and this really makes a difference in combating and adapting to climate change. We have also seen that the role of the uh, civil society organizations is key because they are really want to get involved. They just sometimes need to be given the right framework for that, but we are working on that. And um, it was a pity that our colleague from um, the Covenant of Music in Sub-Saharan Africa could not stay with us. But in the case of this project, which uh, CMR coordinated until uh, last year, we have seen that the role of the civil society organization plays a huge difference in, in making the uh, actions a reality. They, they can really be mobilized very quickly with the right uh, words and the right uh, framework. And then last but not least, I would like to encourage you all to also participate in all the negotiations on climate towards uh, COP this year. As I mentioned earlier, adaptation is also another pillar, a very fundamental pillar of the um, of this COP. Um, as you will know, uh, it's going to be hosted by the UK and Italy. So and they're also working on having a local summit uh, sessions for local leaders. So I also encourage you to participate that virtually, physically, so still to be seen. And we will also be preparing a CMR and platform and some key messages. That was also a point that Constance referred to. We need common messages. We cannot do this advocacy work on our own or uh, divided. So we need to join forces, and this is what we're working on. And uh, we look very much forward to seeing you all and also seeing the results of the debates in the Parliament of the report of uh, Monica Silvana. We also are willing to develop further the initiatives in the EU strategy on adaptation by the Commission. And of course, we will be uh, working with the UN in the activities that are. Uh, Raphael presented today and also in this new initiative that we have just joined. 
So if there are no further comments, I would like to come to a conclusion and then come to the end of our seminar. My colleagues and I, we will be putting some elements together. We will also be forwarding you all the uh, background documents that we have been mentioning in the notes uh, and in the chat. And then we look forward to a fruitful and very close collaboration with all of you. So thanks very much and looking forward to the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.